Hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to a uh, second uh, webinar in our Agricultural uh, Geophysics webinar series. The uh, title and you know, focus of this uh, second webinar is using uh, ground penetrating radar uh, in agriculture. Again, my name is Barry Allred. I'm a uh, research agricultural engineer with the uh, USDA Agricultural Research Service uh, Soil Drainage uh, Research Unit. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-chair uh, for the, uh, this Agricultural Geophysical Webinar Series, uh, Stephen Moisey, who's a uh, associate professor at uh, Clemson University in their Department of Environmental and Engineering and Earth Sciences. And also, I'd like to acknowledge our uh, organized com organizing committee, uh, Slava Adamchuk, who's an associate professor at McGill University in Canada in their Bioresource Engineering Department, Ahmed Farahani, who's an agricultural engineer with the USDA NRCS, East National Technology Support Center, and uh, also, uh, of course, Robert Freeland, professor at the University of Tennessee, uh, Biosystems and uh, Soil Science Department. Uh, Catherine Grody, with, uh, who's an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire in their geology department. And uh, of course, last but not least, Bruce Smith, who's a geophysicist with the uh, U.S. Geological uh, uh, Survey in their Crustal Geophysics and Geochemistry Science Center. And uh, Steve and I really appreciate all you know, the help of the organizing committee and uh, putting this together. So I'd like to go ahead and get started here uh, uh, you know, pretty quickly. And uh, just briefly, I'd like to mention what the format of this uh, webinar uh, is going to be. For the first 30 minutes, we'll have some very short, uh, say, five-minute overview presentations from our uh, presenters that uh, kind of uh, summarizes you know, what they talked about in their extended presentations, uh, which uh, I think most of you have probably viewed. But if not, uh, take the time to go to our website, www.aggeophysics.org, and you can uh, view these extended presentations to find you know, more details. But also, we have archived the uh, presentations from our previous uh, webinar. So I think I'd like to go ahead and begin uh, with our uh, first presenter, uh, Robert Freeland. Um, Dr. Freeland is a uh, professor of biosystems engineering at the uh, University of Tennessee and teaches graduate courses in engineering modeling. He's a licensed, he's a licensed professional engineer and professional land surveyor. His research interests are uh, geophysics and precision mapping technologies as applied to uh, precision agriculture. The title of uh, Robert's presentation today is uh, Data Processing uh, GPR Survey. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Rob. First I might ask, is every, can everybody pretty much hear me pretty well? I hope so. Uh, send in a text you know, or, or a message if you're having problems. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob now. Okay, thank you, Barry. Again, my, good afternoon. I'm Rob Freeland. I'm with the University of Tennessee, UT Ag Research. Mm -hmm. I'm an ag engineer, and my presentation reviews the data processing procedures that normally follow a GPR survey. My overview is I'll be talking about the basic radar gram and describing the radar gram. I'll also be talking about how to correct for the start of scan, be talking, I've talked about filters, both high pass, low pass, vertical and horizontal, about migration and deconvolution. Now the data that I'm using we obtained from the USGA putting green, this United States Golf Association. And it's pretty nice to use because it's a standard construction. So if you're in California or if you're in New Mexico or if you're up in the northeast, if you go to USGA put in green and you run radar, you're going to see the same thing. Uh, it has a one foot deep sand layer. And my, this uh, sand layer is ideal for GPR. You couldn't ask for anything better. And underneath the sand layer is a gravel blanket. 
And this gravel blanket and the sand layer gives a very sharp dielectric contrast for GPR reflection. And within the trench, there's a three inch down grain tile which makes an ideal GPR target. So it's a, it's a pretty nice uh, environment to do GPR surveys. And so the data that I used in my, in my video comes from a putting green. It's displayed in 256 colors. Uh, called line scans. It forms what we call a radiogram. It's a pseudo two-dimensional image. It's not really an image. It's a pseudo image. The horizontal axis is uh, the distance traveled, and the vertical axis is time of reflection. By putting in dielectric constant, you can get depth. Now, in my presentation, I give a brief introductory of overviewing this data, post-processing it, and uh, it, it comes from a golf green. So at this time, I'll open it up for questions. Well, I guess what we'll do is uh, we'll uh, probably go on okay. to the uh, next presenter. OK. And then thanks, Barry. after, uh, thanks, Robert. And then uh, have you know questions in the last hour. So our uh, next uh, you know, presenter you know, for uh, an overview is uh, Catherine Grody. Uh, Catherine has a BS at the Missouri University of Science and Technology in Geo uh, Geological Engineering and MS and PhD degrees at the University of California, Berkeley, also in Geological Engineering. Uh, she is presently an Associate Professor of Hydrology and Geophysics at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Her main research focus is using geophysical techniques for soil characterization for agriculture on geotechnical applications. And uh, Catherine's uh, title of her presentation is Estimation of Soil Water Content Using uh, GPR Techniques. So I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Catherine. Hey, thanks, Barry. As Barry said, I'm going to be talking about using GPR techniques for soil water content estimation and giving you the quick five-minute overview. So I'm going to begin by talking about how we can relate GPR measurements to water content. And the primary parameter that we're considering is the dielectric permittivity. The permittivity of air is 1, water is 81, and dry geologic materials ranges from about 2 to 6. If a geologic material is primarily uh, <coughs> has air-filled voids, the bulk permittivity of the material is fairly low. If the voids are primarily filled with water, then it has a high bulk permittivity. Because permittivity is mostly independent of soil um, mineralogy, we can use a petrophysical relationship to directly relate our permittivity to a water content estimate. In practice, we don't usually measure permittivity directly, but instead we measure the electromagnetic velocity. And the permittivity is estimated under low loss conditions using this equation, where the permittivity is simply the square of the ratio between the speed of electromagnetic wave in a vacuum, or the speed of light C, and the measured electromagnetic velocity V. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to discuss how we estimate permittivity using ground-coupled reflections, ground waves, and air launch reflections. For ground-coupled reflections, data can be collected in either the common offset or the variable offset mode. And in the common offset mode, the permittivity can be estimated if we know the depth to a reflected interface. So in this particular diagram, we know the depth to a reflected interface by using borehole information. Alternatively, if you have an engineered soil, like as a, at a golf course or in pavements, or if you have very flat line soil horizons, the depth to the reflection might be known. In the case where the depth to reflection is known, you can use the measured travel time from the ground surface to the reflective interface to estimate the velocity and then the permittivity and the water content. And ground coupled reflections are especially useful because they can give us a deeper estimate of water content. The reflection, the depth of the reflection is basically the sampling depth of the, the water content. If you don't know the depth to your reflection, you can use air, you can use variable offset data. In variable offset data, the reflection typically forms a reflection hyperbola, and most GPR software packages include an algorithm to fit a hyperbola to the reflection, and then you can use that hyperbola to calculate the velocity and, again, the water content. If a site doesn't have a subsurface reflector or you don't know the depth of the reflector, you can use GPR ground waves. GPR ground waves travel directly from the transmitting to the receiving antenna 
in the shallow subsurface. So the travel path is, is known. The depth of the ground wave is approximately known. It typically doesn't go deeper than about 30 centimeters. So ground waves are good for intermediate to shallow depths of uh, water kind of estimation. Ground waves are also collected in either variable offset or the common offset mode. In the variable offset mode, ground waves are the first linear event to arrive after the air wave, and the inverse slope of the ground wave provides a velocity estimate. Ground waves, it's essential to collect a variable offset survey in order to interpret the common offset survey. So common asset surveys can be collected much more quickly over large areas, and so they're good at estimated water content, say, at the field scale. Um, to estimate velocity using ground waves, you use the measured separation distance between the transmitting and receiving antennas and the measured travel time from the time at which the, the energy leaves the receiver until it's detected at the transmitter. In this radar gram, you can see that uh, there's an infiltrated zone in the middle of the traverse, and the velocity is lower, hence the travel time is, is slower, the arrival time is later for the wet soil than it is for the dry soil surrounding the infiltration zone. A total alternative is air launch reflections, and unlike ground-coupled techniques, air launch reflections don't use the velocity, they use an amplitude primarily to estimate the permittivity, and there's two main ways that amplitude is used. The first is in the more conventional data processing technique, and in this case, the amplitude from the air soil interface, A sub S, is calibrated by the amplitude from a perfect reflector, A sub M, which is usually a metal plate. And you can uh, imagine that the processing here is, is very simple. Um, the drawback to conventional techniques of that the uh, processing is that it tends to be a little bit less accurate, and it does require calibration from a metal plate. More recently, researchers have been working on full waveform inversion, which uses the entire reflection wavelet, both the amplitude and the frequencies, to estimate permittivity. And full waveform inversion is a little bit uh, more robust and gives a more accurate estimate of permittivity. But uh, to my knowledge, we don't have uh, commercially available inversion software yet. Uh, no matter what processing technique you use, air launch reflections are good for the very shallow subsurface, typically only the first three to five centimeters of soil, and they work best if the soil is unvegetated, fairly smooth, and relatively uh, homogeneous in water content for the first couple of centimeters. So in summary, you can use GPR at parameters, either velocity or amplitude, to estimate the permittivity. The permittivity is related to water content using a petrophysical relationship, and we can measure water content using GPR reflections for deeper estimation ground waves for shallow to intermediate estimation air launch reflections if you want only very shallow estimates. So I look forward to answering your questions in a little while. Hey, uh, thank you, Catherine. It looks like we already have a question from uh, Paul Padone on uh, uh, drainable porosity. You might want to look at that and uh, see that we get to the question and answer. Um, maybe we'll start with that question on, you know, if that can be something that can be, you know, measured. So I might want to think about that. Uh, again, thanks, Catherine. And let's uh, ready to go on to our next presenter, and that is uh, Jim Doolittle. Uh, Jim is a uh, research soil scientist with the uh, National Soil Survey Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, However, he's remotely located with the uh, USDA Forest Service in Newton Square, Pennsylvania. He was the uh, first uh, uh, ground penetrating radar operator with the US Department of Agriculture and has worked with GPR in all 50 states. Uh, he holds an MS degree with uh, Northern Illinois University. Uh, and Jim's uh, title of his presentation is the use of ground penetrating radar in USDA NRCS soil surveys and soil investigations. So, Jim, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Barry. Um, I don't have a picture yet. Is um, I guess I can see yours. I can't see it. Holly? Yes, sir. I see it as well. I, uh, I have a black screen again. And it seems to be loading. Um, 
this is Steven. Why don't we uh, maybe move on, Jim, for right now and see if we can get yours opened up. Uh, we'll kind of open it up in a secondary window and, and maybe if it loads during this uh, while John is speaking, then we can get you going next. How does that sound? Thank you, Stephen. That's good. Okay, so I guess we'll go next with, next with uh, John Butner. Uh, John is a uh, plant physiologist with the USDA Forest Service uh, Southern Research Station and has an office at the University of Vermont. He's been using uh, ground penetrating radar for almost 15 years to quantify tree biomass and distribution. Other professional interests include carbon cycling in forest, restoration of longleaf pine ecosystems, and the development of novel research methods and equipment. The title of John's uh, presentation is Applications of Ground Penetrating Radar in, uh, in Forest Monitoring. Uh, John, it's all yours. OK, great, Barry. Thank you. Um, let me see. Mine is just coming up right now for me. OK. OK, looks good. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by giving a brief introduction to the topics that I cover in my talk. Um, and like Barry said, I've been using GPR and forest systems for close to 15 years. Uh, the most common application for me is detecting tree roots and estimating their biomass for forest productivity studies and accounting for carbon that's hidden underground. The uh, traditional tools for quantifying root systems are destructive and labor intensive, and that makes uh, using GPR a very attractive alternative. Okay, so the topics uh, covered in the webinar include uh, estimating uh, tree root mass, tree root mass, uh, root diameter, and the distribution of roots. The photo on the bottom left shows a SIR 3000 system uh, that has an integrated uh, survey wheel. For root biomass work, I typically use a 1500 megahertz or 900 megahertz antenna to survey the upper 50 centimeters of soil. Another topic is using a GPR to detect um, uh, rot and decay in standing trees. Instead of using it on the ground, the antenna is placed on the trunk of a tree. The photo in the, uh, in the center bottom uh, shows uh, two tree climbers who are making a scan around the circumference of an old growth uh, Douglas fir tree. And the last topic I cover is, um, is taking advantage of the dielectric properties of frozen soil to determine uh, the depth of seasonal frost for, uh, hydro uh, for studies in, uh, in hydrology. So the photo on the right-hand side shows a strong contrast uh, between frozen soil on the top and the moist, uh, the unfrozen soil on the bottom. So the dielectric value of the frozen soil is approximately 3 to 4, and the moist soil can be uh, 10 to 12 on this site. So it makes, uh, it makes a very nice contrast. So there are a number of challenges to working in forests uh, that are quite different than working in ag fields or in urban surveys. The forests are often relegated to poor rocky soil the presence of brush, surface debris, and obstacles uh, can get in the way of antenna travel. And these need to be cleared prior to surveys. Another issue that comes up is excessive moisture or high clay content uh, causing signal attenuation. And the last thing is uh, non-target reflections from rocks, voids, or disturbances in the soil uh, from dinging or from, uh, from operation of equipment. So the photo on the, on the left-hand side is up a coast and bog in North Carolina. It's got a, it's got a high water table that's unsuited for GPR. And the, uh, and the photo on the right is a pine stand in Mississippi after a hurricane. There are uh, uh, broken trees, there's lots of brush, and all of this needs to be cleared prior to uh, surveys can take place. So here's an example of root detection in a 10-year-old pine plantation in Georgia. A 15 megahertz antenna was pushed along a 10-meter transect, and marks were placed as, as each tree was passed. So if I can get this pointer working. 
Okay, here we go. So the antenna starts here as it moves across the surface. And when a tree is passed, a mark is placed. And, and that follows down along the line. So looking at the radar gram, the depth was scaled to a maximum of uh, 50 centimeters. And the roots are making uh, very nice point reflections. There's a greater density of roots uh, close to trees and underneath trees. And in the space in between trees, the, uh, the root density is much less. So under suitable conditions, uh, tree roots um, are excellent targets for, uh, for GPR and create a very distinct uh, hyperbolic reflection. The technique uh, tends to work best on soils that don't have clutter from non-target uh, reflectors. And, uh, and the most common ones are rocks, are dead roots that are causing uh, small voids and uh, a recent disturbance of soil. So thanks so much, and I look forward to, the, uh, to some good discussion. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, John. To see as, um, I think we're we ready to go with uh, go back with. Jim, that we have his slides uh, uh, loaded up. Yeah, we're going to give it a try here. Okay. Okay, I can see a slide. Yep, I got it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and let uh, Jim. I'll go ahead and let you get started then. Thank you. Uh, good day. I'd like to talk briefly about the use of ground penetrating radar in soil surveys and soil investigations by the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture and Natural Resource Conservation Service. Characterizing soil spatial variability at field scales um, is a major challenge facing soil surveys and soil investigations. Typically, uh, soil information is collected with an auger and spade or, or with a mechanical probe at various points in the landscape. This point sampling method provides high-resolution data, but data collection is time-consuming, expensive, and generally confined to a limited number of sampling points. Uh, the inability of present field methods to adequately characterize the soil among widely scattered observation points has fostered uncertainty in soil mapping, interpretation, and modeling. Since 1978, ground penetrating radar has been used to overcome some of the limitations of these conventional tools. The speed, economy, high resolution, and continuous sampling of GPR are assets in soil investigation. As a quality control tool in soil survey investigation, GPR has been used to determine the presence, depth, and lateral extent of diagnostic subsurface horizons that are used to classify soils, determine the taxonomic composition of soil map units, and to characterize the spatial and temporal variations in soil properties. The effectiveness of GPR is highly soil dependent. Soils having high electrical conductivity rapidly attenuate radar energy, restrict penetration depths, and limit the effectiveness of GPR for many applications. The electrical conductivity of soils increases with increases in water, clay, and soluble soil contents. On this map, areas colored in shades of green are considered well suited to GPR soil investigation. Uh, soils in these areas are dominantly coarser textured and have low soluble salt contents. Areas on this map colored in shades of brown and purple are considered poorly suited and unsuited to GPR soil investigations, respectively. The low suitability of these soils is a result of high clay or soluble salt contents. The dots on this map show the location of NRCS's 17 radar operators. As you can see, there's a strong preference for areas that are colored in shades of green and have a high potential for GPR. Contrasting soil horizons do produce strong radar reflections. GPR has been used to detect the presence and depth of diagnostic subsurface horizons, which are used to classify the soils, and also to determine the proportion of different soils along transit lines conducted within soil map units. This information has been used to improve soil survey legends and interpretation. In many upland areas, it is exceedingly difficult to examine soil profiles and determine the depth to bedrock with conventional soil survey tools. 
Rock fragments limit the effectiveness of these tools. One of the most effective uses of GPR in soil surveys has been to chart bedrock depths and determine the composition of soil map units based on soil depth criteria. With the near completion of soil surveys in the United States, GPR is being increasingly used in support of technical soil services that help people better understand soils and soil survey information. As part of technical soil services, GPR is being used in the planning of resource conservation practices and resource management systems. As an example, in Florida, GPR was used to provide subsurface information for a wetland restoration project. As evident on this radar record, GPR was used to determine the depth to limestone bedrock, identify solution cavities, and differences in the degree of carcification beneath a wetland area. In this study, GPR provided the spatial information that was needed by wetland managers. The use of GPR in soils and agriculture began over 35 years ago. A strong foundation and pathway in soils and agriculture has been established. Today, younger minds are using a host of complementary technologies and exploring new areas of applications for GPR in soils and agriculture. These younger minds with different interests and skill sets are finding new ways to process, quantify, model, and display radar data. I'm confident that in the near future, GPR will have an expanded role to play in both soils and agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, our next uh, uh, presenter is uh, uh, Peter Annan. Uh, Peter is the uh, CEO of Sensors and Software a company designing and manufacturing a wide range of GPR instruments and related software. Peter has a diverse background in applied geophysics, development application GPR has been a primary area of interest of his for many years. And the title of uh, Peter's uh, presentation is uh, GPR, uh, Qualitative to Quantitative Analysis. Uh, so, Peter, it's all yours. Thanks, Barry. Good afternoon, everybody. I seem to have lots of echoes here. Basically, the talk I'm going to give you today is uh, summarized here from the longer one which is provided. Basically, qualitative to quantitative analysis is the area where I'm really spending a lot of time and have a lot of interest in seeing where GPR is going to go. So the whole intent was to try and provide you with some insight with uh, where things are going in this field. So what do we mean by qualitative to quantitative? Whoops, I just lost my screen. You've already seen a bunch of GPR sections. I'll just iterate what we mean by qualitative. Essentially, the GPR section contains uh, information about the signal coming out of the ground versus spatial position and delay time. All of the analysis generally goes on by picking out an event which is distinguished by its amplitude. So we can see here, for instance, a layer which is showing up as a fairly strong event on the record. The other feature here shown in red is a localized target referred to as a hyperbolic event. The key point here is we're looking at the amplitude the position and the time in, of the information in the section. And from there, what we do is we do our analysis. And everything is based around the scalar wave equation and using time. As you've seen from the other speakers, there's a lot of uh, information we can extract from this section. It's fairly straightforward. And we fit the hyperbola, for example, and we can extract the velocity, which gives us a depth scale on the left here. 
So that's basically what we mean by qualitative analysis. And we quite often will do imaging of the amplitude versus spatial position and depth. These are common displays. The picture on the left is a golf green drainage system. On the right, you can see a couple of pipes thrown in a 3D volume. So amplitude is used, but generally is used in this context. What are we missing? Basically, there's a limited amount of information about material properties. We may want to know the conductivity or some other variation in material. The limited target discrimination. We need more information about properties to be able to really sort the targets out. There are complex spatial details in the data which we don't extract. Gradational boundaries are an example. Yet this whole data set is really rich in information. It's basically a vector field and it contains a huge amount of additional information. So what do we mean by quantitative analysis? Basically, we're looking at the information embedded in the amplitude of the data. In other words, we look at that amplitude as a function of space and time. And if we want to extract the information, we have to be able to model that amplitude function. That means parameterizing the signal path so that we can actually relate certain parts of the features we observe back to the parameterization. Overall, this says we have to be able to put an input into the transmitter of the radar and look at the received signal A of T and be able to predict what we're seeing as a causative source in the ground. That leads us to what's called inversion. In summary, the uh, whole evolution is going on towards quantitative analysis on a systematic basis. There's a great deal of research going on that allowing us to analyze the data in a much more quantitative way. The key things that really drive me are the things that we need to do that. We need higher data fidelity. We need better system characterization. One of the fortunate things is computer power is becoming readily available, so it's no longer the barrier it used to be. In the overall scheme of things, though, we're going to be challenged by research funding and HQP, or highly qualified people, people who can actually do this kind of work. So that's what the main presentation is about. And this is just a quick summary. Yeah, thank you, Peter. You know, uh, I think all our presenters gave a really nice overview of their uh, extended presentations, and I, you know, certainly encourage those in the audience to, um, you know, go to the the uh, www.ag-geophysics.org website or you'll have an opportunity, and if you haven't, again, if you haven't already done so, to view the extended presentations for uh, our talks for the, each of our presenters. And there's a lot of you know, additional details in those extended presentations, and they're all you know, very well done. So I guess the uh, next part of uh, this webinar is devoted to discussion. And I encourage you know, those uh, in our audience uh, if you've you know, heard the overview presentations, if you have some questions, to uh, go ahead and um, submit those uh, now. We have a, a couple of questions uh, already that uh, have been uh, uh, directed towards Catherine, so I think I'll go ahead and start with those. The first question, uh, uh, Catherine, we had from uh, Paul Padone that um, uh, his question is, have you ever estimated the drainable porosity uh, from uh, GPR data? And would you like to 
maybe comment on that a little bit, and then we'll go on to the next question that you have. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at that, and if any of the other presenters want to chime in, uh, please feel free. Uh, so my uh, initial answer is that you can estimate porosity using GPR data, but it only works if the soil is completely saturated, because the GPR is looking at how much water is in the pore space. So if the pore spaces are completely filled with water, then you can estimate the volumetric water content, and that will give you the porosity. In terms of getting the drainable porosity, um, that mostly depends upon the structure of the soil itself. So if the pore spaces, the drainable the undrainable pore spaces are mostly filled with water, then that's going to be confused with the drainable pore spaces. Uh, if the undrainable pore spaces are filled with air, then yes, you can estimate the drainable porosity. Uh, what I would do if I was trying to really estimate how much would drain out would be to collect a GPR survey when the soil was completely saturated and get the saturated porosity and then come back after gravity drainage is completed and do another survey, and that would allow you to calculate the specific yield. Um, so that's, that's how you could get near what you're looking at, um, but no, we're never going to be able to get the exact undrainable pore spaces. We're not going to be able to distinguish those from the drainable pore spaces necessarily. So, anybody else want to chime in on that? Or? Yeah, any of those other presenters or um, uh, organizing committees uh, uh, people want to add anything? Okay, well, uh, Catherine, you have a second question from uh, uh, Chi Chi Chen, and um, his question is, uh, what is the error margin in estimating moisture content caused by soil uh, conductivity in highly fertilized farm land, since high conductivity could affect your velocity estimation? Okay, and um, again, I'm going to answer this to the best of my ability. Uh, Peter might have some really good comments to, to add to this also. So um, in, in general, high conductivity creates a difficulty in collecting good GPR data. If it's a really highly conductive field, you might not get either ground wave or uh, reflection data. So sometimes it's a, a self-answering question because you, don't, you simply don't have good data. Um, at other times, I've collected data in fertilized fields, and the water contents have been fairly accurate when I compare them to gravimetric or TDR measurements. I've had pretty good correlation between GPR and those other techniques, even though it was a relatively high, highly conductive field. Um, that being said, you're never going to get accuracy, I don't think, better than probably plus or minus 3% of the volumetric water content. Um, and I mean that if the volumetric water content is, is 25, for example, it's going to be somewhere between 22 and 28, uh, because there's always going to be uncertainty in interpreting the GPR data exactly, and then you have a petrophysical relationship which introduces additional uncertainty. Um, that's irrelevant of the um, error introduced by the high conductivity. And the other thing I would say there is that if you get really high electrical conductivity, then the relationship between velocity and permittivity becomes more questionable. And I don't think there's any quantifiable way of saying if your conductivity is this high, this is how much error that introduces in the velocity. But it definitely can have an effect because your approximation between velocity and permittivity is less accurate. And uh, Peter might have more to add on that. Yeah, there's a number of things that enter in here. Uh, the first one is that if you do get that much conductivity that affects the velocity, then you probably won't be able to see any signal. So bottom line is that's the big problem. The, uh, an you can actually write out the analytical solution. And uh, you can see how that varies with conductivity because you move into more of a group velocity as opposed to a phase velocity. Anyway, what kind of error would it be? Once you get to the point that the conductivity affects the, uh, the velocity, you're really at a very marginal state. So probably you won't even be able to estimate water content. Well, thanks, uh, Catherine and Peter. Uh, Peter, you have another question uh, from Sandika 
Bordanov. I, I hope I pronounced that uh, name correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Uh, the, uh, Peter, the question is um, how to detect contaminant plumes you know, quantitatively. Do you have some kind of advice on that? Uh, it depends what you mean by, quanti uh, by quantitative and what kind of contaminant. So first of all, contaminants that are not conductive usually are pretty hard to see. They won't really change any of your velocity or attenuation to a degree that will be detectable. You have to have massive volumes. A good example is some of the Dean Apple spills that were done a number of years ago. They changed the essential dielectric property by displacing water and replacing it with the low K material. In that case, you could detect the higher velocity or, or reflections from the low permittivity zones in the water-saturated material. If you start looking at conductive materials, then it becomes much more difficult. What happens is the signal fades out very quickly, but you can't get an estimate of conductivity. So it's very challenging to quantify the number. There's certainly information in the data, and if you put together a full flow solution, then you might be able to extract a conductivity estimate. I'm not sure that answers the question because it's a rather complex answer. So, uh, Nadika just, you know, quickly uh, added in that uh, his interest was in landfill leachate uh, specifically. Uh, for that particular contaminant, is that easier? I, I guess he's wondering if it's easier for quantitative uh, analysis of that or, or, or uh, the leachate would be very conductive okay and it would be a matter of whether or not you could get any handle on the conductivity usually what you do is get the signals blanking out as soon as the GPR signal hits the conductive contaminant so it's hard to get a quantitative number on the amount of uh, contaminant you can get the geogra geographic or ge geometric shape or distribution, but not the absolute concentrations. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Chi Chi Chen has a uh, question for John uh, Butner, and this is: uh, What is the objective of, of tree root detection? Detect density or uh, individual roots? Um, John, you kind of want to maybe elaborate on that? Okay, sure thing. Um, but it could be either, and it depends on the survey goals. So root density, or number of reflections per unit area, could be a proxy for, uh, for root colonization or for utilization of a site. So in that case, uh, root density um, would be great for that. See, I typically uh, use image analysis processing to try to estimate the, um, uh, the amount of biomass from uh, uh, from a certain tree, from a planting, or from a civicultural treatment. So, so that's the other approach. And then, uh, and then there's something kind of in between the two uh, that's used in urban settings, and that's actually trying to uh, to identify and map individual roots and estimate their um, uh, shape or diameter. And uh, and this is something that's becoming a little more common now. It uh, it tends to be fairly complicated, and um, and and it really needs to be for high-value type uh, type applications. Uh, thank you, John. I guess also the, another follow-up from Chi Chi. Uh, I think this is directed to Peter. It's kind of a follow-up on the question on the conductivity, I think, and contaminant plumes. Um, I think. It, Hopefully I got this right. The question is a uh, follow-up with previous question on connectivity. Can we be more specific on heavy farmland for the top couple of feet? Mm, not quite sure. Is that a little bit vague on that question? <laughs> Peter, do you have anything to say on that by chance? Or? Oh, 
Hello? Hang on, you hear me now? Yeah, uh, can, okay. can you hear me? Yeah, that's okay. good. Uh, yeah, I'm suffering just, from a, quite a loud echo. Oh, sorry. I, I hear you just fine. Okay, as long as nobody else hears the echo. It just means I can't talk and listen at the same time. <laughs> okay. But you're coming through very clear to me. Okay, the uh, question for the Chi-Chi has here is, what can you say about the top couple of feet? That's right. Well, if you can see through a couple of feet, that means the conductivity is going to be probably on the order of 10 to 20 millisiemens per meter or max. Otherwise, you just won't get any detectable, say, direct ground waves, for example. So at that point, if you go through the numbers, you will see that the conductivity probably doesn't affect the bulk of uh, the velocity calculation by more than a few percent if you could make the measurements. So I would say the error that you would get from conductivity would be no more than the uncertainty you would get from simple velocity measurements and applying the top equation to get a water content. And then Catherine referred to like 3%, something like that, and that's a reasonable number. I'm not sure that answers it, but... No, no thanks, uh, Peter. I think, um, hopefully it's an answered Chi-Chi's question. Okay, we... Uh, next question is from uh, Mark Abney. Uh, this is for John. I've been working with uh, density of uh, root mass and crop production in relation to soil health. Do you think that I can get some useful data to demonstrate increased root mass from cover cropping versus conventional tillage? Okay. Um, okay, I'm here now. Um, I guess it depends on what the definition of uh, density of root mass. So there's root density, and that would be the number of roots in a given area or number of detectable roots. And, and it could also, I think, I think what, uh, what Mark is probably asking is, um, is the density of roots as in the mass of roots or, or concentration of roots. And I guess it would, um, it would really depend on the size of those roots and, and what the crop is. is. Is it a woody root or is it a very fine root? Um, I've been asked to, to work on cotton and other annual crops, and um, I just have not tried that yet. I would think the trickiest thing would be trying to, to mitigate uh, some of the issues of moisture, because these different uh, the cropping systems will probably have um, strong differences in moisture retention. But it's uh, it's something that could definitely be uh, looked into. But it, in terms of the smallest root, I can usually detect on an individual basis. Um, in forest systems, it's usually about a half centimeter, and that would be probably in the upper 20 or 30 centimeters. And that's using a high-frequency antenna. Uh, that would be uh, 1,500 megahertz or maybe uh, 2,500 megahertz. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I guess while we have some time for some other questions come in, I have a, you know, one that um, I think I'd like to, to direct to Jim. Um, this is something I, I kind of thought about when I was looking at your extended presentation, and you talked about some uh, uh, GPR investigations done at a uh, kind of a dam site, uh, looking at um, you know uh, structural integrity and also sinkholes, but. I was wondering, since the 1950, the USDA NRCS has built approximately 12,000 of these uh, small dams uh, across the uh, watersheds in the U.S., and many of these dams are kind of reaching the end of their 50-year design life. And Jim, since in your extended presentation you talked about, you know, surveying at uh, kind of this type of setting for looking at sinkholes and structural integrity of the, uh, the spillway, I'm just kind of wondering about your opinion and what role you think that uh, GPR could play in regard to 
the needed decisions on repair and decommissioning of these NRCS dams. I mean, particularly, what information might GPR be able to provide in these kinds of settings that would help in maybe kind of making some of these decisions? Uh, I know Jim might want to maybe comment on this, because it seems like it's a big issue that will be coming up in the next a uh, few years with all of these, like I said, there's 12,000 of these um, kind of smaller reservoirs that have been built on watersheds across the country, and there's a lot of decisions on repair and decommissioning that need to be made. It looks like uh, GPR could provide some information for maybe making those decisions. That's probably, let me get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, uh, we, we've worked quite a bit with our, our geologists and engineers on a number of dam sites, and uh, one of the problems is that a well-constructed dam generally has a lot of fine materials in it, and uh, depth of penetration and resolutions are, are problems. Um, uh, the engineers and geologists are more frequently using electromagnetic induction to find different zones right now within the dam that would indicate uh, piping or any zone of weakness. I've used the radar successfully to locate slumping areas. Um, perhaps the, uh, these dams, they impound water. And one and another problem we have is uh, rates of sedimentation. And in that respect, uh, it's a uh, much better probability that the radar is going to provide good information. So we've done a lot of lake sedimentation surveys and trying to use the baseline of where, how deep the um, sediment pool was and then how much is filled in. So that perhaps is a better application. I can't say that um, radar has been a failure on, on dam sites, but it's, it's site specific. Um, there's more times when it doesn't work as well as we want, and that's why we opted for uh, electromagnetic induction. Or actually, the best combination would be if you have a combination of both tools that you can use. Hey, you know, when you uh, are have you been able to use GPR for, you know, kind of assessment of, um, you know, sedimentation uh, uh, buildup in the, the reservoir? Yes, yes. Okay. We've uh, done a lot of work up in um, uh, New York State uh, uh, with the uh, engineer up there and uh, former geologist. Um, uh, in New England, uh, we're mapping subaqueous soils, and that's in my presentation, uh, subaqueous soils. Um, generally within two meters of um, uh, the surface. Uh, uh, we, we're having good success with that as long as the water is not conductive. Uh, generally speaking, in the Midwest, if you have conductive soils around it, you have a lot of dissolved solids in the um, uh, uh, reservoir, and your depth of penetration is much more restricted, let's say, in the Midwest than it is here in the east, southeast, or northwest. Also, Jim, I guess you have a, a question from uh, uh, Chi Chi. Chi Chi. Again, it's uh, probably looking at your extended presentation. You know, why isn't GPR being used everywhere? I guess you maybe had a map that showed where uh, NRCS had, you know, locations where they had GPR equipment. Or it, it can be it can be used in every state. Uh, there's some areas that are more suitable for deep penetration. Uh, uh, you know, even in those areas where it looks good, there's other factors in the soil that can uh, uh, compound uh, the interpretation. Um, We've used it, as I say, in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Saipan. Uh, it's worked for different applications. Um, you know, one of the applications uh, we're using this for is historic uh, archaeological sites, and it's a very wonderful tool in that respect. Um, here, here you see, well, the map that's up there right now is where we have our radar operators located. And, um, I, I, you know, Chi Chi's out there at Ohio State, and uh, you've got some real heavy clay soils out there. And I wouldn't put a guy in uh, Columbus, Columbus uh, Ohio, um, with a radar unit unless he was, uh, you know, had some, um, you know, we had more uh, favorable responses there. But you have had some good luck with detecting agricultural drainage tiles in um, uh, uh, 
Ohio. So it's a, it's a matter of what we're looking at uh, in, in the soil and, of course, the soil type. I don't know if uh, I've answered Jim uh, Chi Chi's question or not. I'd like to see more out in the West Coast. Uh, previous uh, respondent, Paul Padone, uh, he's he's operated the radar out there. He's a geologist out of the Portland office, and I'd love to see a radar unit up there in the Northwest. Well, it seems from your soil suitability map that the uh, Pacific Northwest looks like it would be really nice locations, you know, are very suitable for GPR investigations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, uh, just maybe while we're uh, waiting for more questions, I have one I'd like to uh, direct at Robert. Um, I know, uh, Rob, in your presentations, you know, uh, extended presentation talking about analysis of uh, GPR data, you, you know, discussed the spatial frequency filters and migration and deconvolution techniques, but one of the things that you know, I thought maybe you might expand a little bit on is one item you did bring up in your presentation regarding the application of various up, uh, color attributes uh, to the GPR data, and you know, maybe why this can be a simple but uh, <clears throat> very powerful tool you know, for interpretation. Uh, it seems like you know, well, I'll, I'll let you maybe, if you'd like to, maybe talk a little bit about that uh, and why you know what's uh, I guess all the options that you have for assigning color attributes. Uh, you know, what, what the benefit of, of doing that is sometimes. And, uh, okay, Barry. Um, well, I, th I think for the people who have used GPR and, and have extensive use in GPR, this will be kind of a simplistic answer to them because. Uh, I'm sure everybody has scrolled through the color schemes before and been able to pick out things. Um, and it's, it's sometimes a matter of user preference of what color scheme that you use. Uh, you can really pick out a lot more detail if you're, for example, using 256 colors over, uh, over uh, eight colors, as we started out with many years ago. I think they're even increasing the color schemes to, to higher levels now. Uh, what I have up on on the screen here is a 256 uh, color scheme where black is, is no reflection or zero amplitude. And as you start going positive and negative, they have equivalent colors. But uh, going, pro going positive, you'll have a brighter color. As opposed to going negative, you'll have a, a dimmer color. And, and this, to me, is, is just how I tend to like to look at the color scheme. But if you switch it over to grayscale, and I, don't, I do not have a grayscale image, Lots of times the hyperbolas will show up. So you might miss a hyperbola uh, if you're showing it in this color scheme. And here's an example of, of a, uh, let me turn the pointer on, the, a hyperbola that you would probably miss in color. But if you switched it over to grayscale, uh, it, it just stands out. So just uh, just changing the color scales, the, the range, of the ramp of the, of the, of the colors can Lots of times we'll bring out things that you would miss normally. And I have a, uh, Barry, should I answer this question? It's popped up. Yeah, uh, you have a follow-up question from Chi Chi, so uh, go ahead and fill that. And the question is, do you calibrate GPR data to remove distortions caused by system and antenna properties? Uh, no, I think that's pretty much a follow-up. Uh, anytime that you have a system or antenna property, you have ringing, and it's, it's uh, these horizontal, uh, lots of times they'll show up as horizontal bands, and they're consistent through, throughout the profile. And the way to get rid of that is simply run it through a, a high-pass filter, and you filter out the, this uh, low-frequency noise. So I tend to, you can do it in the field, but uh, normally you're, you're busy, so I, I tend to uh, uh, do this post-processing, take out the, the system noise and, and regard that and the, anything having to do with the antenna. Barry, this is Steven. Uh, so I have one quick comment for everybody. 
to, to follow up on that. Um, if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask following up on past questions, you can go ahead and do that by just clicking on the question in your question and answer box and uh, typing the question in there, and I think it should be associated. For example, I see GSSI is offering to uh, be happy to help do more radar right. out west. So anyone who wants uh, help with that, maybe uh, reply to GSSI and let them know. Yeah, I'm looking at a, uh, thanks Stephen. Uh, I'm looking at a question that, uh, again, coming in from uh, Sandika Wija Warden. Uh, um, K of uh, Eric is 1, K of water is 80, so can we detect waste buried or deposition of waste layers beneath the soil? Um, I don't know. Um, would anybody like to field that, any of our presenters? Could you repeat I'm not the sure question? what the question is. It looks like can you Some detect buried waste? Too. And the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> as long as you can get signal down and back, you'll certainly see the structure, the disturbance associated with the burial deposit. There's a lot of good case history examples of people finding buried trenches full of debris and things like that, so I would say the answer is yes, provided you can get enough signal down and back. Uh, John Butner here. From, uh, from recent work on military bases in uh, forest settings, I found uh, a number of trenches that would be filled with uh, various types of operational uh, things out there, and, uh, and it was very obvious in the near surface, so I advise people not to dig those up. If uh, Chi Chi had a comment um, to make uh, system dependent, uh, wouldn't it? I guess maybe that's directed to Rob. I'm not sure. If maybe it's just a comment, not really a question. Is, is this for me, Barry? Will this make this? Uh, I'm guessing that it is. Um, I don't know if you have anything that, uh, again, it's just this. You, you, can, you can see that the comment question yourself. I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add or maybe we'll just go on. I think the point Chi Chi's trying to make is that if you uh, look at the data per se, the, uh, the view you will see is dependent on the system characteristics and if you used a different system you'd see a slightly different image. And so as a result, if you could process the data to take out the system characteristics, then your images would look consistent. I think that's the point he's trying to make, but I'm not sure. Thank you. I have a, you know, again, while we're waiting for maybe some more questions from the audience, I have what I'd uh, maybe like to bring up, maybe um, uh, for Peter, Catherine, John, others. Um, but this is regarding, okay, when, uh, say a radar signal has a travel suit soil that's uh, being attenuated, of course, and the amount of uh, radar signal attenuation, you know, is determined largely by the electrical conductivity of the soil, with the greater the soil electrical conductivity, in turn, the greater the radar signal attenuation. You know, it seems, you know, kind of based on this, Possible then, do you think, uh, to obtain the uh, field information on signal attenuation and in turn use that to either, you know, maybe qualitatively or maybe even quantitatively be able to map soil electrical conductivity, maybe obtain some additional information with your GPR survey say, uh, in beyond, you know, say mapping depths to soil layers or uh, positions of, uh, you, know, you know, features, but also the uh, soil electrical conductivity pattern that may, say, affect the quality of data that you get in one area for another. I'm just wondering if that, 
can you use that, get that attenuation information of the GPR signal? And if you can, in turn, use that to maybe qualitatively, quantitatively back out what that uh, soil electrical, electrical conductivity pattern is. I think I've you know, maybe mentioned that to Catherine before, but I'd just kind of be interested in what everybody thought about that, whether that's a possibility, uh, additional possibility uh, with PPR. That's kind of open to anybody, you know, Peter, Catherine, John, Rob, uh, Jim, whoever would like to maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, this is Peter, I can say that it's sort of like the holy grail for me to be able to do that, and I've tried to do it for decades, so it's not an easy thing to do. Um, what you have to do is understand that the amplitude of the signal goes up, and it, you can certainly see where there's higher and lower attenuation. But every time you try to get an absolute number out of it, it really is a challenge. You need to have some sort of amplitude reference you can get back to and then somehow be able to ratio what you observe, say, from a reflection to an area where there's a known attenuation or loss or very low attenuation, and then that ratio could allow you to extract the conductivity. Invariably, it's just about impossible to get reliable numbers. I've tried to use the direct ground wave many times for that. And I quite often can come up with amplifying conductivities or attenuations because the numbers are just too irregular to depend upon. So yes, it can be done. Some people have done it in very good situations, but it's not routine. But what if, I guess it sounds like the, it's not ready to you know, make maybe quali quantitative mapping, but could you get uh, just from attenuation just a, a general feel for you know, maybe the spatial pattern of electrical conductivity, even though the, the values that you're, or may not be correct, but maybe use attenuation as a correlation just to get an idea of what spatial patterns might be present. That's, That's doable, and I think what you're really saying is um, if we have a good target, or probably the best example is a reflecting horizon in the ground mm -hmm. that is widespread and you can say well the amplitude is varying up and down and I'm going to attribute that amplitude variation to changes in the conductivity of the material above that horizon and yes you could then come up with a relative attenuation map and that's been done a few times. Okay, and that, yeah, that relative attenuation map of people try to go back and you know, say, see if that, what the, the, the correlation is with it, say, uh, with respect to a uh, map generated by resistivity or EM methods? Yeah, yeah. I've done that for the, the ground wave, Barry, and uh -huh. I can't say it's been an unqualified success. I was surprised that I didn't get better uh, correlation between the amplitude data and the, I, I had the induction data. Um, and I think, for me, the difference happened to be coupling. So like with the ground wave, if you have changes in coupling, that can affect the amplitude fairly significantly. Uh, that being said, uh, at a different site, I had pretty good success in correlating amplitude with soil texture. So I tried looking at uh, water content from travel time in soil texture and then amplitude in soil texture. And amplitude actually did a better job correlating soil texture, possibly because it's dependent upon both water content and conductivity which of course also is influenced by soil texture. So I don't know if you can get as good of a conductivity map from amplitudes as you would from you know, resistivity or induction. Uh, I think you can get a, a suggestion, but there are other factors, you know, even, even things as simple as battery life, if you're doing a long survey, that you have to consider with the amplitude. So it's possible, but you know, like Peter said, it's pretty tricky, I think. Okay. Just kind of wonder yeah, if you can get this, you know, additional information out, out there, you know, just beyond, you know, some of the other things that you're looking at. So. I would say that there are tools coming, okay, so when we start to look at the full waveform analysis, that tends to be able to provide you with a much better indicator of conductivity because it's part of the overall system response or the full amplitude response, and so 
you have to account for the conductivity in that modeling or that setup. So yes, it does come out. I mean, you can look at Jan van der Kruk's uh, direct ground wave sort of uh, um, dispersion analysis, and he can pull out numbers for both conductivity and permittivity and depth. And there's a few other things going on like that. And that's really where the future lies if we want to get, quote, more quantitative about these things. Uh, thank you, Peter and uh, Catherine. Yes, now we have a, another question from uh, Paul Fadone, and I think this one is for uh, for Jim. And he's asking, uh, what are the recommended antennas for uh, soil investigations? Uh, we we typically use from about 120 up to about uh, 500 megahertz for soil investigations. Uh, Paul, uh, on my extended uh, presentation, uh, we did a, a wetland restoration project in Oregon uh, near Bend, and uh, we, we did a wet area, a slough basin, and we used a 70 megahertz antenna, and we traced the basalt down to about 15 meters. So it depends on the application, but for most, most work, uh, 200 to, um, to 400, 500, somewhere in that general range. Uh, that's one we typically use. Um, my preference has always been the older 120 megahertz antenna, and some people like 100. It's sort of like, why do you drive a Chevy and why do you drive a, a Ford sometimes? Uh, people have uh, their preferences, and they feel more comfortable making interpretations off of one antenna uh, rather than the other. Um, that's not scientifically based, but that's just the bias that we have. At each of the NRCS sites that have uh, you know, GPR equipment, they usually have kind of multiple antennas? They, so they can, have I multiple guess. antennas. They have 200 and 400 megahertz antennas. Everyone has them. But uh, uh, we have a, a, a frequency range of uh, 70 to 900 <laughs> megahertz right now. Um, we, we haven't, uh, you know, soil health is a, 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 an issue that's uh, looming. Uh, it's there. It's on the horizon. And... Uh, John has answered a question about roots, and we haven't gotten involved in root detections or biomass, below ground biomass, as much as he has, but I can see that happening in the future. Yeah, I see another question. Uh, uh, Stephen, is this from you? It says. Yes, it is. <laughs> You want to go ahead and uh, uh, ask it um, and direct it to, to you, who you'd like to? Sure. Um, I was wondering if uh, someone, uh, maybe Peter in, in particular, you know, coming from sensors and software, would be willing to talk a little bit about uh, what the frontier of radar is. Where are we going in terms of the technology? What kinds of equipment is going to be out there? And how far are we? from being able to, you know, sit on our tractors and map an entire field and get water content from that whole field. Interesting question. You can sit on your tractor now and drive over the whole field with GPR. I'm not <laughs> sure whether you'll get water content, though. The, uh, I think the, there's two or three things. Number one, the technology is really great for doing what we do now. The qualitative analysis, looking at variations of features with time and space and so on and the relative amplitudes. We've come a long way just doing that and the big advances over the last decade have been putting in, you know, more and more units so that you can cover areas quickly. So the multi channel stuff has gone on and and the big plus is you cover area more quickly. The downside is it's a bigger, more complex system to move around. And so if you have a wide open area and so on, you can do some great things. Uh, where are the barriers? Where are the challenges that I see? And, you know, what I think is going to change over the next few years? It's really in some of the quantitative stuff I've been mentioning. And, and I know, and I talk to the people who are trying to do full waveform inversion. The issues are, what is the source? Where is the source point? What does the antenna really generate? And how can we characterize the wavelength that's going out? And how can we translate what we observe on our records, this amplitude versus time, into something that is a measure of the 
electric or magnetic fields and what is the vector component we're looking at. So it's doing all those characterizing of the systems in a quantitative way so that we can actually start getting a quantitative indicator out. And I mean, the question that Chi Chi raised earlier on about this will make the system dependent or depending on how you couch that question independent. Um, if you can characterize the system parameters in such a way that you can take them out of the response, so you're seeing just the ground response and not the overall integrated system response, you can start to do much more quantitative analysis. And so that's where the future's coming in terms of doing a lot of things that to date we'd like to do but could never do. Uh, and it goes from measuring water content in a more systematic way to trying to extract conductivity and detailed geometric structure and targets. So that's where the future lies in my mind. And, uh, this is uh, Barry. I want to mention one other thing. And, um, uh, you know, I think Rob might want to comment on this and <laughs> correct me where I'm uh, wrong because I think he has a little bit more background in uh, precision farming. But, yeah, precision, you know, farming is, you know, you know, is and, and I think in the future will become a, a, a you know it's a growing trend in agriculture, where we have you know agriculture uh, equipment you know for application of fertilizer and pesticides and uh, maybe even you know tillage effort where we applied you know you know you know based on integration with uh, RTK GPS we apply just the right amount of fertilizer or pesticides or, or whatever at every, you know, location in the field. So it's not a uniform application. It's, uh, you know, a variable application across the field. And I, I can almost see, you know, having sensors integrated with this variable rate application uh, farming you know, technology that uh, provides that information as you're moving along the field that, you know, can be used to adjust what that variable rate application is. Um, that's, you know, a long ways down the line, but that's kind of one of the things that I envision uh, for future agriculture. Uh, Rob, I don't know if you want to maybe comment on that uh, yourself since you have a lot more of a background in precision farming than, than, than I do. Well, um, yeah, this is Rob Freeland. I've been involved in it for 20 years and doing GPR, and I can't get beyond the plot. Right? <laughs> when you start taking this to 100 acres, to 500 acre fields, and doing GPR, it's overwhelming. Um, we, we finally we're up to to the point now where we record the data. We have enough data storage capacity, but still, it is just too much data to process uh, either in real time or post process. It, uh, I guess post processing is possible, but Definitely not in real time right now. I guess with, with the speed of computers increasing, it will will help. But uh, uh, I, I've not been able to if, to do a 500 acre field with GPR or a thousand acres um, like you can with EM. It's, it's just not there yet that I that I can see. Uh, one one of the things that I that I find interesting is the hybrid technology, hybrid antenna technology. Barry, do you, could you? Uh, I think you've played with it a little bit more than I have. Do you have any comments on the on the hybrid antenna type, this, this concept? Yeah, I guess I was really excited about the, uh, the one time we got a chance to use that. I mean, it's nice having both the you know, high-frequency data and, and the low-frequency, you know, the high-frequency for maybe improving some resolution, you know, uh, in the, the kind of the more shallow just beneath the surface and but still with the uh, lower frequency being able to get sufficient penetration depth to look at features, you know, that are, are further down. I think that's, you know, really exciting, you know, uh, and again with the, a lot of these um, multi-channel systems uh, that are out there. Um, sometimes, you know, I think that, you know, for example, you know, you know trying to uh, drainage pipe detection that you're not really sure you know, which antenna frequency might, you know, work best for a particular scenario based upon, you know, soil conditions. So uh, hybrid um, antenna or 
multi-channel you know, systems where you can actually collect data at different frequencies is uh, really a, a pretty exciting and maybe a much more efficient way you know, in, in terms of, say, mapping subsurface infrastructure like pipes when you're not really sure to begin with what frequency is going to work best for you. So those, those things are, are, are really exciting. You know, as you know, I think they'll find, you know, without doubt, you know, much greater use in the future uh, for agricultural applications. Uh, anybody else like to add in anything on the uh, uh, next frontier with GPR equipment? This is. Steven, um, not to jump in on the speakers or anything, but I might add something, you know, to what Peter was saying, you know, about uh, the ability to, to be able to do quantitative analysis. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, of opportunity there to look at uh, transient data, so like before and after event kind of data. and that has some potential to maybe get over some of those quantitative kinds of problems, although you know, there would always be some coupling issues in terms of how the antennas are interacting with the ground. But I think there's room to do that. Um, you know, and, and there's been a lot of interesting stuff coming out you know, doing quantitative analysis, like Sebastian Lambeau with the air launched antennas. You know, it seems like he's been doing uh, quite a bit in terms of mapping large areas. I don't know if... Uh, Peter wanted to add anything to that about uh, about how reasonable that kind of approach was or not, but uh, it seems like it's pretty pretty promising. And then with the multi-channel kinds of systems um, that Peter mentioned briefly, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity there for also going and getting quantitative data where we're not using the amplitudes, but maybe doing more of a traditional kind of analysis like Catherine was talking about you know, looking at the, the change in travel times with offset and trying to look at water content that way with a large array. I don't know, did anyone want to comment on any of those points? I guess just sort of to build on those points, I agree that those are really interesting and probably where the technology is going. But in my mind, the biggest hurdle right now is that we need to have software that is relatively novice friendly if we want more people to use it. So like jumping down to one of uh, Chi Chi's next questions, he said, how much of a role does GPR play in agriculture today? And I think our biggest limitation is that some of the most useful tools like full waveform inversion and you know dispersed wave analysis aren't really accessible to typical GPR users. And even things like multi-channel you know, GPR, which I think have tremendous potential, the software that I've, I've looked at, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems like it's primarily a focus towards a common offset data, whereas I think if we had something that might be able to do automatic processing of you know, variable offset data using the multi-channel uh, equipment, that could be really, really useful. But I don't know how far away we are from having the software that could do that. Like if we ever want anything real time, we've got to have something to automatically process the data. And for me, that's the biggest time sink is when you're looking at data because we've, you, you know, obviously the software to make it easier to, to quantitatively interpret data, but it's still a fairly uh, user intensive uh, process right now. Uh, John Butner here. I'd have to agree with that. That's probably the um, uh, the biggest issue I face is is I'll go and work in a forest stand and collect uh, thousands of meters of data in a single day and then I might be struggling with certain issues with it uh, for the next two or three weeks after that. Anything else anybody would like to add? Uh, Peter here, I would just say that's the area where you're going to see one of the bigger revolutions. Already there are applications where if you know what you want to get out of the data, and you can standardize your acquisition process, automating the outcome is pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the things that's wrong with most technologies is we're still too dependent on the operator. And um, so that's an aspect of making your systems and hardware 
simpler, more robust than more standards so that you don't have to have a great deal of expertise in the operator. So that means then your data analysis gets simpler. So that's one of the things that's going to happen. I think there's other things, like Chi Chi says, is that the wideband antennas, it's bandwidth, it's not frequency that really is important. It's the bandwidth of your system. And can you get uh, better bandwidth into your data? Um, and then finally, one of the things I think that's also coming here is just the integration of multiple sensors. I mean, we hardly ever integrate EM and radar and mag together in one coherent acquisition package. Um, and that's another area which is coming, and I think that's going to be part of the ag use of geophysics in general. It's the integrated solution. But it's all going to require smart software and user-independent operation. Sudden silence. I'm trying to look at all the questions that we've got. Uh, yeah, I have uh, another one, Catherine, for you from uh, uh, Nadika Wijerwadana, um, I don't know if you've looked at that one. And he's, uh, he's asking, or they're asking about uh, when we measure uh, soil moisture, some items we cannot get with the radiogram with reflection, either ground wave or reflection wave. How, come, how do we overcome this, especially under mostly dry conditions? They're having <laughs> difficulty getting their ground wave. Right, um, and that's going to be largely a site-specific problem. Uh, my guess is I can't get anything is that maybe it's a, the site is high electrical conductivity and there's just simply too much attenuation. Some sites just aren't applicable. Um, another thing that could be tried, of course, is using a lower frequency antenna and keeping the antennas relatively close together, although that, of course, causes problems with superposition of the airways when you're looking at ground waves. So that's a, a possibility if it works. Uh, another thing that I've found is that even though dry conditions are supposed to be optimal for GPR, I've typically gotten better results if the soil is at least a little bit moist. And I don't know if there's a possibility that you know they can measure the soil moisture at different times or if they only want to get dry times. But sometimes if there's a little bit of moisture in, I think you get better coupling with the ground wave than you do if the soil is very dry. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I would also uh, mention uh, what Stephen was saying about uh, Sebastian Lambeau's work in Belgium and what they're doing with surface reflection and inversion. I think that's a, what a great step forward as well, and I think it's been one of the things that we saw when we tried to do that work about 10 or 15 years ago was that we could not get consistent water content just assuming the simple surface reflection. You had to actually have a layered structure and invert for the parameters of the ground and then extract water content that way. It's a much more difficult analysis problem, but it's a much more robust solution. So that may answer this question as well. One thing I was wondering, uh, I guess uh, this is Barry, um, in terms of um, you know, using the uh, airborne kind of antennas for measuring uh, water content. Uh, you've mentioned, you mentioned that the surface needs to be fairly flat, but how big a role is, you know, like would vegetation play in, you know, obtaining those water content values? Say you just have a, um, maybe a, a short um, grass cover that's well maintained, still be able to, in that kind of methodology, get water content? Uh, does it have to be bare ground? You're asking, this is Peter here. Um, if you're asking me, I would say it's a matter of scaling your problem. And if you have, say, five or ten centimeters of uh, uh, biomaterial on the, surf, the surface, then if you want to get into the soil, you need to have uh, bandwidth so that you have a pulse width sufficiently wide that 
will average and ignore that thin layer on the surface. And if you're doing a full waveform inversion, you may actually build that into the model so you estimate the water content of both, uh, say, the bio layer as well as the layer underneath. And so that's how you approach it. It's not so simple as I say it, but that's the way you go at it. The other factor is surface roughness, which uh, can certainly mess up the data as well, and that's one of the things we looked a lot into. Dave Redman and I did a lot of questions about that when we were doing elevated measurements over uh, sort of corn rows after harvest. It's a very irregular surface, and that scattering or roughness does change the reflectivity, and you have to consider that as well. Yeah, Peter, my understanding is that you can't have surface roughness more than, say, like three or five centimeters of, of variability. Is that accurate, or can you, you know, sort of, for example, a plowed field wouldn't give you accurate estimates. Is that still true, or is technology advanced beyond that? Uh, that's still true. I mean, you have to look at the scale of the roughness compared to your pulse width or your wavelength or whatever. If you have a very low frequency content pulse, which has a long spatial scale, you you won't see that surface scattering as being there. It'll look like a fairly flat, smooth surface. But if you went in and used, uh, say, a, a pulse which is only a few centimeters long and you got 10 centimeter surface roughness, it's going to be total nonsense. Uh, so it comes back to scaling your your measurement system to the geometry of the surface. I mean, and historically they've used higher frequency antennas for airborne because of the calibration issue. Is that going to change now that we're going to more full waveform inversion? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by calibration. You mean like uh, taking the thing and running it over a metal plate? And then right, right. When they used, exactly, when they wanted a to reduce the size of the plate they needed for calibration. So they used the higher frequency antennas. Is that the higher frequency antennas is that not going to be as necessary? Um, okay, you've got two problems there. The uh, What happens is that you're trying to make that plate look like a perfect reflector mm -hmm. and uh, uh, or like a half space reflector. And if you make it too small, then the reflection coefficient you're estimating is height and size of the sheet dependent. So you won't get a good calibration number for your antennas because you're trying to get an amplitude reference for your data. So by going up in frequency, you can make the plate look bigger, but now you face a bigger problem with surface roughness. If you have to deal with surface roughness and you have to put out a bigger plate, and run it at a lower frequency or a longer pulse width or whatever to get to that result. So that's how you approach it, and you can't do you can't do it without considering surface roughness and the scale of the problem generally. And I know that even just a little bit of roughness, even on high frequency antennas on paved roads, surface roughness starts to come in. So it's it's not <coughs> something you can totally ignore. You really want to keep your you know, scale relative of your pulse relatively long compared to the surface undulation. I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's uh, it gets rather messy when you get into surface roughness of significant size compared to the scale of your pulse. Sure. Yeah, no, that answers the question. Um, yeah, I just wondered, sometimes it seems that the air launch data, there, there are enough complications that it's difficult to really apply on the agriculture setting. But I still have hope that that might change more in the future. Well, I think it's already there with from what I've seen Sebastian doing and from the experiments we've done over the last few years is that it it's quite doable now. Um, what you're doing with the metal sheet is really trying to take out the system parameters, so you're only worrying about uh, the relative amplitude of the signal coming off the surface compared to a metal perfect reflector. 
Uh, but if you start to bring in full calibration of your system and in full waveform inversion, then suddenly you can push that a lot further. Sure. No, uh, thanks, Peter and, and Catherine. Uh, that's a really interesting discussion. I think we'll kind of reach the uh, our um, uh, the, our time limit for a webinar. So. What I'd uh, like to do is, you know, you know certainly, you know, thank all of our presenters for, you know, the uh, the great effort they you know, put together for the extended presentations and also for the overview presentations that are here today. So we'll be uploading the webinar itself onto the Ag Geophysics uh, uh, website that I mentioned before that you can uh, see the the site address uh, here on your screen. Uh, so again, uh, if you, uh, for the audience, if you have some additional questions for the presenters, you can go to the website and direct your questions, uh, you know, to them. And we'll make sure that the presenters get your questions and uh, can maybe uh, send you an email response. This is the. Um, uh, again, you know, very much want to thank our presenters that did a great job. Also, you know, thank uh, uh, Stephen Moise, the uh, co-chair that's uh, our organized, com organized committee. They've all done a lot of work in putting this together. This is going to be an ongoing series. Um, ours uh, probably sometime early. Next year, we haven't decided on the topic yet. Touch with all those that are in the audience and let you know of uh, future um, uh, webinars that we're planning to put on. Well, I think that's about all I have. Uh, Stephen, there's anything that you'd like to mention at this time? Um, no, I just wanted to reiterate uh, your thanks to everyone, Barry. Um, it was really great to, to have all these presenters be willing to come and, and talk with us today, and uh, I'm really grateful for that, and uh, and for uh, also being able to be hosted for this webinar as well. Barry, you want to say thank you for that? Yeah, this is Peter here. I would say thanks very much, guys. This worked out pretty well once I figured out how to get rid of the echoes and all the extraneous sounds. And thanks to the audience. So we had some really active participation and some really good questions and for uh, NRCS uh, for um, uh, helping you know host this. Uh, uh, Holly Cookendall, you know, I really we appreciate all the effort that she put forth in helping us uh, you know put this webinar on today. So that's uh, about all I have. Uh, Maybe periodically check in with the Ag Geophysics website. Uh, we'll maybe again upload the recording for this webinar and try to, try to provide some information for future webinars. So, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Yep. Thanks, Barry. Bye bye. <laughs>